here we are at the 10th anniversary of Maker Faire. One of its little brainchilds was Tech Shop. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. So uh, before I get started, I got to do a shout out to Jim, the founder of Tech Shop, and Robert, the co-founder. It is pretty rare when we're actually all in the same city uh, anymore at the same time. And then Doug is actually an, uh, a board member as well. So we got, we got lots, of, uh, lots of friends here. So let's talk about inspiring a nation of uh, makers. But first, um, I'm, I'm forced by my contract with the publisher to encourage you to buy my book early and often. So uh, the Maker Fair, that was a joke, by the way. All right, yeah. Um, so as, as everybody knows, it, the, the maker movement is beginning to get a lot of uh, national and, in fact, uh, international attention. And it's cutting across um, all kinds of different types of industry segments and societal um, uh, you know, points of interest, education, politics, manufacturing, innovation, um, are, some, are some of the keys. Um, and that's kind of nice because when, you know, early on, there was this idea that basically, you know, this was a, a, re, a reinstitution. The maker movement was kind of just a reinstitution of the uh, county fair with robots instead of animals. Uh, but it goes substantially deeper than that, and policy people are starting to grasp that, and, and so, um, so are others. Others like, these are just our partners. Of course, you walk around and you now see you know, Microsoft and Google and, and all of those folks there. But you know, GE, DARPA, BMW, Autodesk, Lowe's, Fujitsu, ASU, and actually, most big companies still don't know what the maker movement is. Most of the time when I fly and I sit next to somebody and I tell them I'm part of the maker movement, they have no idea what it is I'm talking about. This is like the, you know, this is like the internet in 1994. It feels to me like we've made like six months progress over the last eight years. And we need to do a much better job of getting the news out that no, this isn't just a county fair. This is fundamental. Making is fundamental to what it means to be human. Manufacturing is fundamental to economies. Creativity and innovation is, in fact, what drives economies and creates value. And it's, it's insane that most of the world, and actually most of the United States, still does not know who we are and what we're doing and why it's important. And so part of that is because we haven't articulated our stories really well. And, um, and we need this, like, I believe we need a pantheon of heroes that we can, like, point to, and they're just kind of part of the gestalt. Says, well, the maker movement, well, did you know that this came out of it, and this came out of it, and these things happened, and these things happened? And so I'm going to talk a, a lot about some of the tech shop stuff, because in my mind, these are a pantheon of heroes. But you need to choose your own stories, and you need to let people know that this is a movement. That's the reason I called it, the, you know, that's why I called it the, uh, the, the manifesto, is it is a movement. There is a gestalt, it is a revolution, and we need people to join it. This is a really big deal. Now, I know I'm preaching to the, audio, you know, to the, to the choir, um, but we need to do a better job, a more aggressive job, of selling the maker movement as something that's fundamental um, to the future of the United States and around the world. And I don't have this slide, but I'll talk about the impact that Tech Shop has had from an economic perspective, just again, as just having an, another you know, arrow in your quiver when you're saying, look, this is really important. These are, these, are, you know, these are why. We're getting a lot of new locations. I won't spend any time on that. Let's go into the tech shop success stories. So this is uh, Lightning Motorcycles. They're right, they're right here just outside of town. They built the entire motorcycle in our Menlo Park space. Anything they couldn't buy off the shelf, they built themselves. The, the, the carbon fiber fairing, the aluminum chassis, um, there's no such thing as an electric superbike motor. They had to make it. They had to use the mill and the lathe to build it. There's no such thing as an electric superbike harness. They had to make it. This thing won Pike's Peak this year. It beat every other electric motorcycle and the entire motorcycle field. The Ducati Monster Superbike came in second and finished 20 seconds later. When was the last time you saw a professional race and the second place finisher came 20 seconds later? Never in my entire life have I seen that. And this was built at a makerspace tech shop in Menlo Park. And they're now, I think it's in September, you'll be able to buy one of these and it will actually do 218 miles an hour, like off the shelf. They're just replicating what it is uh, that they've built. They want to become the Tesla of uh, motorcycles. Um, I put Andy Philo in here, uh, basically because he's in the NASA booth uh, next door. He was doing such a good job designing a, uh, an actual jetpack 
with an airflow that was 20 times more effective than what NASA was using, that NASA hired him, and he's now doing chipsats and all kinds of other uh, interesting things. He works mostly out of the San Jose location. We've had multiple CubeSats, um, mostly out of San Jose State, that have been launched out of the International Space Station. This speaks to the educational component of what makerspaces and what makers are doing. They actually get, have the opportunity to build a CubeSat and get it launched into outer space. I love this one because Tina was an accidental entrepreneur. She came in on a Wednesday, took a laser cutter class, and on Friday decided to make cupcake toppers for a birthday party for her, um, her nephew. The next day at the end of the birthday party, she walked out with about $400 in orders. She didn't know she was in business. She had no intention of making more, but it was just so cool that everybody, it was like literally, the, you know, a mom would come out and says, look, I'm glad I got Bobby, but I need Jane and Janet. Um, can you, can you, you know, I'll give you 20 bucks each. And she's like, $20 each? I was like, wow, I, I, could, I could actually make some money. And sure enough, she walks out with $400 in orders. Like within a couple of weeks, she's got $800 in orders. A couple more weeks, she's got $1,600, then $32. It just literally went asymptotic on her. She launched an Etsy page that did so well. One time I saw her, she had two Blackberries. One was just for all the texts coming in from the orders that she was getting. She had to swap the battery out every four hours because it was literally burning up the Blackberry. And then she had her one for personal communication. And she vanished for a while on me, and I was like, well, I don't know where she went. And I saw her again, you know, six months later. It's like, Tina, what happened? Well, when I got married, you know, we didn't have enough money to go on a tour, so I just got back from a world tour with my husband. This is from a single $60 introduction to laser cutter class. And she's completely remade her life, her lifestyle as a result of it. I love Perrin, he was one of the first members that we had in San Francisco. He came in and said, um, you know, Mark, I'm a copywriter. I'm a newspaper advertising copywriter in 2011. I just lost my job at, um, at Hearst. You know, I'm 62 years old. I am never going to work as a copywriter again. There are no newspaper advertising jobs that are ever going to hire me. Like, what are you going to do, Perrin? He says, I'm going to become a jeweler. Now, that's not obvious, right? <laughs> he spent 40 years becoming a copywriter, and he's actually quite, he's quite good at it. Um, uh, and now he wants to be a jeweler. And sure enough, within about six to eight months, after you know, never making anything, six to eight months later, his jewelry starts showing up in MoMA here in San Francisco. And he's got a nice little business now with museums all over the United States. He started with the laser cutter. He's now actually doing metal and stamping and all kinds of other things. This is fundamental. Don't go back to school. Go to a makerspace. And six months later, you can re-educate yourself on these new tools because the tools are easy, powerful, and cheap. And that's new to the world. He didn't go back to trade school. He didn't go back to a junior college. He didn't go back and get a master's degree in something else. He just came in and taught himself a new skill and launched his business. And that is new. I believe that's new to the world. You've never been able to operate in an environment where you could, within six months, teach yourself enough of a skill to be able to support yourself. Now you can. Unfortunately, the world is architected around the assumption that that's not possible. And that's changed. And again, it's part of the reason why we've got to get the, uh, we've got to get the word out. Let me keep going. Again, see, it's a, it, find out who these people are. Meet them. Tell your story. Build a story. Let people know that the maker movement is changing the world. This is David Lang. How many, how many know David in, in, in here? We've got about 30, 40, 50 percent. So he's here as well. He's got the open ROV underwater uh, robot company. He came in, he's got a book I highly recommend, uh, Zero to Maker um, by uh, O'Reilly and Make, uh, Make Media. He came in the first time I met him and says, hey, Mark, this is my first day here. Um, I've just convinced Make Magazine to let me write a column called Zero to Maker. I don't know how to make anything. I've never made anything in my life. He says, well, that's not true. I do really good emails, and so now I'm going to learn how to make things. Nine months later, he and his partner, Eric Stackpole, launch a robot company. How do you do that? You don't know how to make anything, and nine months later, you're a principal in an underwater robot company. And these guys are great. They're doing this whole citizen science thing. They've sold over 1,000 units. They had an incredibly successful Kickstarter campaign. He's been all over the world. He's gotten all kinds of awards, um, as, as has Eric. And they're literally, I think they may be right outside here or, or around the corner, so you can go, um, go visit them. Britt Morin, oh my gosh. So she quits her job at Google. I've heard it's a pretty good place to work. Um, 
she quits her job at Google, she comes to Tech Shop, and she hasn't made things either, and so she starts making things, and then she realizes sometimes making can be tough, and what would be nice is if we had kits, and so she starts making kits and selling them to all of her friends. And then she launches her own company. This is a multi-million dollar enterprise. She's literally been described as the Silicon Valley's Martha Stewart. She had, I, was, I had an opportunity to speak at her event, uh, I think it was in, in January, down at Fort Mason. She had like 800 women from all over the United States who were creating kits that then she sells through her platform that go out all over the US and around the world. She completely remade her career. Again, in about eight, eight to nine months. Um, and she is absolutely a hero. Is Mark in the room by chance? So Mark Roth has uh, the Learning Shelter. That's also here today, and I want you, you need to go uh, visit it. Mark came in, um, paid, we had, a, we had a special, it was pretty cool, a few years ago, which, note to self, we should do this again. It was $50, if you haven't been a member, it was $50 and one class. So it was an introductory thing, we, you know, we call it sampling. So it was a little, little paid sampling. Mark was homeless, found out about us through a, a little brochure, and uh, comes in um, like 9 a.m. as soon as we open the door, goes around, spends his last $50 on a membership and class, takes the laser cutter class, and then reboots his entire life. A $50 investment, self-motivated. He learns how to use a laser cutter. He starts grabbing things out of the recycling bin and remaking them and selling them on the street. He then gets good enough at the laser cutter that we hired him, not knowing he was still living in a shelter, as an instructor to teach all our members how to make things. Our members sometimes don't have enough time, so they started hiring him at $25, $35, $50 an hour to do, uh, to do laser cutting for them. He convinces one of them to help, and he launches a Kickstarter campaign and buys a laser cutter, and he starts off, he has an entire laser cutter business now and a couple of employees. Better yet, he took that experience and said, you know what, we need to do this again. He's formed a nonprofit in San Francisco, he's raising money, and he's going into the homeless shelters looking for people like himself. He sets them with a place to live, gets them food, and a three-month tech shop membership, and they, he's helping people relaunch their lives in the process. I mean, I just, you know, give it up for Mark. I mean, it's just, that is just uh, phenomenal, right? This is, this is the maker movement. It's this, this kind of activity is the maker movement that people need, uh, need to learn about. Of course, type A machines, I think they're here. Somebody confirmed that for me. They've got to have a, a booth here. They, uh, they started out um, actually in, um, oh, what was it? It wasn't in our space, but he came, they came over and formed a club started working on uh, the MakerBots, and, and if any of you know MakerBots, they can break. And so they said, you know what, we can do better than this. And they started experimenting with how to make them better. And pretty soon, Make Magazine identified them as the, uh, the most reliable 3D printer made, and that launched their company. They went from literally a club to a company. They bought space for about a year and a half um, on Tech Shop, and they've since moved. They're now in San Leandro. They've got about 25 to 30 people. I think they just took down 15,000 square feet, and they're selling hundreds of these things um, a, a week. Launched uh, launch their company out of the space. Love these guys. This is one of my favorite from this la the last two years. Um, so I ran into Max, and um, I asked him, you know, so how are you going to scale, Max? He said, well, I'm going to do a Kickstarter campaign. Ten years ago, this ecosystem didn't exist. There was no Etsy. There was no uh, Kickstarter. There was no tech shop. And if you wanted, if, like Max, wanted to launch a lamp company at 24 years old, you would have had to have gone to the bank, taken a mortgage out on your house, or gone to an angel group, which would have been a complete waste of time. Because trust me, there's no angel group that will fund a lamp company from a 24-year-old designer. So ten years ago, it wasn't possible. Three years ago, it became possible because we have Etsy, we have Kickstarter, and we have Tech Shop. So he comes in, learns how to use a laser cutter, because he hadn't been doing that. Learns how to use Arduino, takes the class, self-teaches the rest, creates a prototype. It's got a lithium-ion battery, Arduino, which he knows doesn't scale, but who cares? The point is to show the prototype. On Kickstarter, it doesn't have to work, it just has to look pretty, right? At the end, you still have to deliver, that's the, that's the hard part. But he knew how to deliver, once he had the money. So he, I asked him, so what are, you, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for $60,000. Max, you're screwed. 60 grand, half of all, at the time, half of all the Kickstarter campaigns over 2,500 bucks failed. 60 grand at the time would have put you in the top 10%. Top 10% for a lamp. 
I, I don't, Max, you know, is there any other way of doing it? He says, no, there's no other way of doing it, Mark, but I really believe in my product, and I think I'll be able to get $60,000. Um, so Mark was wrong, <laughs> and Max was right. He raised $480,000. Launched his company, it's now doing millions. I think he was on track to do like $2.5 million in sales this year. He was on Shark Tank uh, season finale last year. Um, they had a, what do they call it, a feeding frenzy or a shark frenzy. All five of the sharks wanted a piece of his company. He ended up walking out with double the valuation and a line of credit to be able to scale. I mean, it is it's absolutely uh, remarkable. See, this is for Max. And anyone else who has a dream that thinks they can, uh, they can make something. You know, part of, the, part of the trick here is failure is cheap now. It used to cost millions of dollars to launch a hardware company. It now costs about five grand to get to, like, to, get to the prototype, or $500. Or in the instance of like, like Britt Mora or, or Tina, $50. You know, I have venture capitalists ask me all the time, well, you know, how, do, how do people deal with failure in, that, you know, in the tech shop context? It's like, failure? This is called cheap learning. When you spend $500 trying to launch a company, it doesn't work. I call that, that's, that's like a seminar. That's a fabulous seminar because you're not gonna do the same mistakes that you learned about next time. You do that a few times and eventually you'll hit it and it'll actually work. We've seen a, a number of those. Or Ukayak is also here. Again, I told you, I, I'm picking ones that you can actually go out and see with a little bit of time that's left. Um, similar kind of story, Anton comes, I, I see Anton, it was actually kind of funny. I come upstairs in San Francisco and, and Anton, who's a, he's a pretty big guy, he's about my size, and he's on top of our tables, which are, are you know, oversized, are pretty high, and he is wrestling a 12-foot piece of corrugated plastic, and he is losing, as far as I can tell. He, I'm, I'm afraid he's gonna fall off, he's got his knee in it, and you know, he's trying to fold it and, and so forth, and I, I was like, I go over and ask him, you know, Anton, uh, what are you doing? Um, he says, I am building a collapsible kayak. I'm sorry, my MBA like kicks in, right? This instinct and, and this like, did you get everything right and so forth. A collapsible kayak? That is a stupid idea. I don't, I don't want to be in the San Francisco Bay in a collapsible kayak. <laughs> That's the last thing I want. It was like, you're, what are you you're competing with the leaky boat company, the, you know, the, the aircraft company without wings. It's like, That's, that's insane. And I asked him, you know, what's your plan? I'm gonna do a Kickstarter campaign. It's like, good luck with that. Come on, how big is the boat industry? How big is the kayak industry? How big is a collapsible kayak industry? Good luck with that. Of course, I'm wrong. He raises about $450,000, launches his company, sold it like 1,000 of them. He also was on uh, Shark Tank uh, this last season and closed a deal with, with one of the sharks. Give it up for Anton. And you go, go see him. He's, uh, uh, they're, uh, they're around the corner. What, we saw a photograph of the San Francisco, um, you know, the Giants in the, in the World Series, and they did a picture of, of the boats. And it's like it was an advertisement for Anton. There were like five of these things um, out in the water. It was, you know, it was fabulous. Maybe he organized it. This is one I tell all the time. Uh, so this is uh, Dodo Case. That's uh, Patrick Buckley. Uh, the case, he, he came in and asked, what classes do I need to, need to take to learn how to, to uh, make an iPad case? It was three classes. 90 days later, he had sold a million dollars in product. He did four million in the first year, 10 million in the second, 35 million in the third. He owns a manufacturing facility up in San Francisco Bay Area. Again. What classes do I need to take to learn how to use the tools to launch my company? 90 days later, he's got a million dollar product. When in human history did we have an opportunity to do that? Again, people ask me, well, do you think the maker movement's important? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But here's where, you know, here's the punchline, um, and we'll, we'll burn through the rest of these real quickly. None of these change the world. The next six have. That's how powerful the movement is. That's how powerful learning how to manufacture is. That's how powerful access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution is. Oh, oh, and by the way, yeah, the President of the United States carries um, one of, uh, one of uh, Patrick's cases. Actually, a really early one. When, when Jim and I, we had the, the pleasure of meeting the President last year uh, at Tech Shop in, in Pittsburgh, he made a very explicit point. He had, this, he had his Secret Service guy go run down, grab the iPad, and show it off to us. Um, and as a result, I got to take a look at it, and I happen to know for a fact it was one of the early ones. Someone on his staff got him, like, had to be one of the first 1,000 or 2,000 um, of these. Uh, you know, 
How many people have an opportunity to launch a company in 90 days that the President of the United States is like your lead year user? Uh, things that have changed the world. So James came in um, and uh, launch, helped to launch Square out of our location. Yeah, Square came out of our Menlo location. The story here is that Jack and um, James hit all the VCs in the valley and got turned down. Just imagine that, just for a minute. This company's worth $6 billion. They went to all the top VCs in the Valley, showed them a PowerPoint presentation, and got turned down. Then James comes in, learns how to use a mill, leverages the community to help build the electronics. I actually think Jim helped a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. And then they go out and they show the VCs how it works. So they literally took $50 off each of the top VCs. That part of the story is fairly well known. They took $500 off the VCs, never gave the money back. I just love that. It's gotta be the first entrepreneur ever to charge a VC for the presentation. And then raise $10 million, and I say the, uh, the rest is history. In, I think it was in August of 2012, um, there were 70,000 jobs created in the United States. 35,000 of them were a result of small companies having access to um, credit cards for the first time. They literally drove half of the growth in, growth in one of the months in the United States. Let's give it up for James. This is the world's most efficient data cooling center system. They are responsible for helping to set the bar uh, in an entire industry that is on track to save $25 billion in electricity. Let me restate that. So it turns out that cooling data centers is a $250 billion annual spend. Big competitors, IBM, Emerson, and others. Phil and Bob came into our Menlo location, spent $20,000 over three years, and created a system that was 10% more effective than the best system on the planet. Forcing the entire industry to step in line and find a way to save more electricity on their system. When Emerson finally found these guys, it took them about 60 days to cut a deal. So this is in, in Emerson's uh, product line, and it's helping to reduce the carbon footprint and the energy required in a huge industry. This is a newer, uh, um, a newer success story. It was named one of the top five agricultural startups of the year. This is a BioLite. They were, they were at uh, New York City uh, Maker Fair. I don't know if they're here this year. The world's cheapest drip irrigation system. And then um, this blanket, which I'm not going to fully describe because I'm running out of time already. Um, so this, is, this came out of the Stanford D School. This is Jane Chan, uh, Naganan Murthy. They had a couple of other co-founders. Um, this blanket uh, is designed for uh, neonates in third worlds um, to try to help them to keep their, regulate their temperature. It turns out 500,000 babies die a year from not being able to regulate their temperature. This blanket solves that. The core technology was improved through interactions within the community by 900%, and it has saved 150,000 babies. What can the maker movement do for you, can do for your community? It saves lives, it creates jobs. The, the impact that Tech Shop, as far as we can tell, has had in the Bay Area, oh, not, not Tech Shop, let me restate that. The members of Tech Shop, our customers, have created $12 billion in incremental shareholder value, 2,000 jobs, $2 billion in annual sales, $200 million in annual salaries. The state of California is pulling out $20 million on the income tax on an annual basis alone. Why is the maker movement so important? Because it is remaking the economy. So I was, believe it was Deloitte that said that by 2030 or 2040, half of us are going to be working for ourselves. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be working, a lot of us are going to be working in the maker movement. I got a couple of announcements I want to make. So we need more maker spaces all over the United States. And uh, we can't open them fast enough, and they're very expensive, and they're very difficult to run. Um, so what we're doing is, you can go to our website now, we are going to start teaching people how to run a makerspace. It's called the Tech Shop Makerspace Academy. We just announced it about two weeks ago. You can go on the web. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's the, right, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, right, it's the right thing to do. So it's three and a half days, deep, intensive engagement with our, with our staff, with all of the learning that, you know, about how to run a space. We'll actually teach you how to pull a MakerBot apart, put it back together, how to operate a laser cutter, what things break, what things don't, and, and how to do it. And at the end of the three and a half days, you'll get a certificate that says you know how to open a makerspace. And of course, then you'll be able to call us and say, oops, I just made a mistake, how can, I, you know, can you help me? And we can say, oops, we made a mistake, can you help me as well? Because you guys are gonna learn a whole bunch. 
I also want to announce a Fujitsu relationship. So this is, our, this is both international expansion as well as some really cool things that we're bringing to the U.S. through them. Of course, you've seen the trailer, which is um, out back. If not, go check it out. Get yourself signed up. Get your kids' school signed up so that we can come visit it, and they can get a 3D printing experience, a laser cutter experience, a little bits experience, and start getting embedded, kind of get this whole maker movement embedded. We are also looking for two really cool, sick, interesting projects to prototype a design and manufacturing make service offering that Fujitsu and TechShop are jointly going to stand up. So one of the big problems in the makerspace we all know is how do you get to 1,000 units? Who's going to help you? What do I not know about design and manufacturing? Sometimes I have a great design, but I don't know actually how to make it. We are partnering with Fujitsu, one of the largest integrated manufacturers in the world, to create a, a maker platform so that you can actually put stuff in. You don't have to do it all yourself. We'll get Fujitsu and TechShop to help you. And this is entirely new. This is the first time we've actually talked about it in the United States. We're going to pilot it with, uh, with Fujitsu, and we're looking for two really interesting projects. So if you've got an IoT uh, type of a project, or you've got a cell phone project, or you've got some, any kind of computer thing that's really interesting, if you have something that requires lithium-ion batteries and so forth, just think about what Fujitsu does. Send me some ideas, and we're going to pick two, and they're going to run it through a manufacturing process. Really cool. We are pushing our, um, and this is going to happen in September, so in conjunction with the academy, we realize that not everybody knows how to teach how to use a laser cutter. We've got like 60 of these you know, laser cutters, 3D printers, sewing machines, water jet, and so forth. So we're going to start pushing all of our content onto the cloud um, so that libraries and other folks will be able to use them to be able to teach, to kind of try to raise the safety bar across uh, the maker movement, because we need thousands more of these maker spaces in the U.S. and around the world, and we need to do that. And just for a quick shout out, yes, we are talking to Fujitsu about opening a Tokyo location. So Munich is, uh, Munich is on its way. I think it opens next month. Paris, our friends from uh, Leroy Merlin uh, are here in town. Paris opens in October. Abu Dhabi opens in December, LA opens by the end of the year, Louisville may be open, and we got St. Louis uh, on its way. Um, again, what was my point? My point was, we, I, I believe in, in order to, to convince folks that this is important, you need a pantheon of heroes that you can talk about. You need to be able to talk about James McKelvey. You need to be able to talk about David Lang. You've got to talk about Mark Roth. But then you also have to deliver the numbers, because at some point, somebody's got to write checks. So just to repeat, $12 billion in incremental value, 2 billion sales, 200 million in annual salaries out of just three locations. Imagine the impact when there are a thousand of these or tens of thousands of these locations around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>